I recently read the book Emotional Agility by author Susan David. If you're challenged by someone in a work meeting and they make you feel stupid, how do you deal with the anxiety and the anger you feel? Do you bottle it or do you brood over it? If you're a bottler, you'll try to forget what happened and suppress your emotions. You'll distract yourself by doing busy work like checking email instead of having a private conversation with the person who just challenged you. Bottling is like storing a corrosive substance in a plastic bottle. You might be able to contain the toxic emotion and not think about it for a while, but soon it'll eat away at you and start to leak out. Psychologist and author Susan David says suppressed emotions inevitably surface in unintended ways. Perhaps you're angry with your brother. You try to suppress it. Then after a glass of wine at Thanksgiving dinner, a snarky comment slips out of your mouth and now you have a major family drama on your hands. She goes on to say that more than once, I've met bottlers who find themselves years later in the same miserable job, relationship, or circumstance because they haven't been in touch with a real emotion in years, which precludes any sort of real change or growth. If you're not a bottler, you might be a brooder. If you're a brooder and receive a rude comment in a meeting, you won't stop thinking about it, and you'll find it hard to focus on your work later in the day. Susan David says, Brooders pay too much attention to their internal chatter and allow it to sap important cognitive resources that could be put to better use. With brooders, emotions become powerful in the same way a hurricane does, circling and circling and picking up more energy with each pass. If you're a brooder and you work in an office, you'll walk around the office looking for someone to talk to, but the more you vent your emotions, the more you come across as self-absorbed and cause everyone around you to experience empathy fatigue. Whether you bottle or brood over distracting and uncomfortable emotions, those emotions get stronger and more destructive. Upon reflecting on my own emotional coping style, I realize that I'm a bottler and I need a better way to deal with uncomfortable and distracting emotions. After reading Emotional Agility by Susan David, I've learned and implemented the following four step process to deal with every distracting emotion in a productive manner. The first step to becoming emotionally agile is to name your emotion. Several years ago, Susan worked with a man named Thomas, who had lost his job, his wife, and was living on the streets. When Susan asked Thomas to explain how he felt about his dire situation, he replied with, just a little bit of bother. When Susan asked Thomas how his mother was, the closest person in his life at the time, he said, it's just been a little bit of a bother, she died. His inability to name his emotions has caused emotions like fear and anxiety to ruin his life. Unnamed emotions can cause uncontrollable stress. It's like walking through the forest and hearing something in the bushes and thinking it's a cougar ready to jump out and eat you. But if you look closely, you can see it's just a harmless fox. To name an emotion, you need to face an emotion and think to yourself, oh, I'm experiencing uncertainty, or oh, I'm feeling insecure, or oh, I'm starting to feel angry. Author Susan David says, learning to label emotions with more nuanced vocabulary can be absolutely transformative. People who can identify the full spectrum of emotion, who realize how, for example, sadness differs from boredom, or pity, or loneliness, or nervousness, do much, much better at managing the ups and downs of ordinary existence than those who see everything in black and white. Now, after you've named a distracting and uncomfortable emotion, don't fight it. Accept it. Our consumer culture has taught us that the goal is to always be happy. If you're not happy, there's a product out there for you to make you forget about your worries and feel good. But Susan says, the goal is not to always feel good. The goal is to deal with destructive thoughts and emotions so you don't get hooked, i.e. you don't identify with your emotions and derail your progress, your relationships, and your career or business. When you accept a negative emotion instead of running away from it or fighting it, you strip that emotion of its power. As Susan says, we end the tug of war by dropping the rope. To accept your emotions, simply feel your emotion without judging it. An emotion is neither good nor bad, it just is. But now just because you've accepted an emotion, that doesn't mean you need to listen to it. An emotion is like a person in the backseat of a car, telling you where to go. If you can learn to step out of your emotion, step number three, you can see that your emotion has no power over you. To step out of your emotion, you have to imagine yourself standing outside of your body and your feelings and looking back at yourself with curiosity. By stepping out and detaching yourself from your emotion to simply observe your emotion rise and fall, you start to, as Susan says, see yourself as a chessboard filled with possibilities rather than any one piece on the board, 
confined to a certain preordained move. When you hear a rude comment and experience anger, you don't have to react aggressively. You can step out of your emotion for a second and choose to respond in a thoughtful manner. When you feel anxious in a social setting, you don't need to instinctively reach for your phone and distract yourself. Instead, you can step out of your emotion, watch your anxiety rise and fall, and choose to be polite and start a conversation with the people around you. When you step out of your emotion, you get a chance to remember what matters to you. And complete step number four, act according to your values. When you're experiencing an intense emotion, it's like you're driving in a dense fog. But by stepping out, it's as if the fog has suddenly lifted and you get to see the road ahead, the signposts on the edge of the road, and the sun on the horizon. Those signposts signify your goals and your values. There are specific people that you value more than others. There are specific activities that bring you more joy than others. And there are specific goals in your life that matter most. You can forget those values when you're consumed by an emotion like stress or anxiety. You can work too much and neglect your family. You can yell at someone you love, or you can binge eat to cope with your stress when you really value your health. But now that you've named, accepted, and stepped out of your emotion, you get the opportunity to ask yourself, if I react to this motion, am I acting according to my values? If you get in the habit of asking this question whenever you feel a distracting and uncomfortable emotion, then those emotions become a reminder to act according to what you value and choose to live a life that matters. As Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor and author of Man's Search for Meaning once said, between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That was the core message that I gathered from Emotional Agility by Susan David. Susan is a highly knowledgeable psychologist with a wealth of information to help you navigate difficult emotions. I highly recommend this book. If you would like a one-page PDF summary of insights that I gathered from this book, just click the link below and I'd be happy to email it to you. If you already subscribed to the free Productivity Game email newsletter, this PDF is sitting in your inbox. If you like this video, please share it. And as always, thanks for watching and have yourself a productive week.